All right, friends. Well, here we go. Welcome to Calaveras Big Tree State Park. My name is Jenny, and I represent California State Parks here in one of our 280 state parks that we have here in California. Calaveras Big Trees is named Calaveras Big Trees because of the county we are in, Calaveras. And Big Trees is a nickname for the giant sequoia because they are one big tree and they are going to be the focus of our adventure today. And there's one right behind me. So I am here in the Sierra Nevada mountains and we'll take a little look at a map here in a second to get us all orientated. And Calaveras Big Trees is the home of the giant sequoia. So this is probably one of the best state parks. I know you've all been to Morro Bay, Anza Borrego, Baldwin Hills. I've been to all these places in real life. They are incredible places. We are really lucky to live in such a wonderful state with all these parks and beautiful places that are protected by California State Parks. They belong to you and everyone. So this park is home to the giant sequoia. They are an incredibly rare tree. They are a big tree. And guess where they like to live? In California. Aren't we lucky? So you can see there's one giant sequoia behind me here. Now that's actually a small one. We have some here that are a lot bigger than this one. Takes about seven people to make a circle around the base of this tree. And we have some trees here that are so big, takes about 20 people to make a circle around. So they can grow to be really, really wide trees. And they can also be very, very tall. So sometimes they can grow to be as wide as a two lane road and as tall as a 30 story building. It's pretty impressive for a tree. So I'm gonna take this camera and we're gonna go all the way up into the tree top. Hope you all are ready. Here we go. Up the trunk of this giant sequoia. It's a beautiful day here in the Sierra Nevada mountains. There you go, up like an elevator. We are looking at the skyscraper of the forest right here, everyone. The one and only giant sequoia. Here we go, back down the trunk. So when I say a 30 story building, we're talking about a tree that is over 300 feet tall. So they are not the tallest trees on earth. That title belongs to the Coast Redwood. They are a cousin of the giant sequoia. They grow on the coast of California, as you can imagine, with their name. And they're not the widest trees on Earth. There is a tree, Montezuma Cypress, in Mexico that is over 125 feet wide. However, if you put together the width and the height, giving us the volume of the tree. Some of you math wizards out there know what volume means. You are looking at the biggest tree on earth here. So by their weight, by their volume, they're the biggest. So who has seen, oh goodness, that's a wasp. Who has seen a giant sequoia in real life before? Maybe you're one of the lucky ones that got to see these trees in real life. Because sometimes when you don't see them in real life, it's hard to understand how big they are. Because they're really big. So what I like to do is compare them to something we might be more familiar with. Because in LA, you guys are far from me. You're probably about five hours away in a car. So let's compare them to something we are more familiar with. Everybody, let's picture in our imaginations, you might have to close your eyes, do it. Picture the Statue of Liberty in New York City. That blue statue's got her crown, her little tablet in her arms, her torch is in the air. Now, do you think that, that statue is going to be bigger 
than a giant sequoia? Or do you think a giant sequoia is going to be bigger? What do we think, everybody? Maybe you want to type it into your chats. I know you all are watching on different uh, things. Statue of Liberty versus the giant sequoia. Are you all ready to find out the answer? I'm going to reveal a picture. Hopefully this will work. Here's the answer, everybody. Did you guess the right answer? The giant sequoia is going to win against the Statue of Liberty. It was a close call, though. That statue is about 305 feet tall. And our biggest giant sequoia that we know of, that we estimate to be about 316 feet tall. So there you go. We are looking at one big tree. And the giant sequoia, though, you're not going to find one in New York City. These trees are very particular about where they want to grow and where they want to live. And we'll find out why on our adventure today. We're going to find out all kinds of things on our adventure. We're going to find out why these trees are so big. We're going to discover where they like to live. We're going to learn how they grow and why we have them here in a park. All kinds of fun things. So I hope you are curious and you come uh, well rested, ready to learn things. Um, I know you're all watching on different devices and things, but you can use the chat to communicate with your classroom and share answers to all the questions I'm going to ask. So we're going to have a little fun, probably spend about 45 minutes, 60 minutes. So the giant sequoia are a Sierra Nevada mountain tree. They only like to grow here in the mountains of California. And we'll find out why. But let's, put, let's um, all look at a picture right now of our beautiful state. So we can get orientated to where I am because I'm guessing a lot of you haven't been to Calaveras Big Trees. We're pretty far up there from LA. So let's get orientated. Let's look at this map. So there you go, there's our beautiful state, California. And I drew a green circle on that map to show you where Calaveras Big Tree is. And look closely inside that circle, everybody. You're looking at a little yellow blob, two yellow blobs. That's Calaveras Big Trees, our north and south grove. We have two groves of giant sequoia here, totaling about a thousand real big trees. So they grow in groups called groves. So you're looking at two groves there inside that green circle. Now I wanna point out another few groves here. I'm gonna circle this for you. That right there, Yosemite National Park. There's three groves of giant sequoia there. And then you're gonna see this big yellow blob right here. That yellow blob is about 70 groves of giant sequoia. That blob is Sequoia Kings Canyon National Park, National Monument, uh, National Forest. There's a lot of giant sequoias there. In fact, the biggest ones on earth live there. You might have heard of the Sherman, General Sherman, General Grant, Grizzly Giant. These are all names of some big giant sequoias. And that's where they live, in that park. It's about four hours from me. And you all are way down here, Los Angeles. LA area. I used to live there for about 11 years. So we're pretty far from each other, about a five hour road trip or so, probably traffic six hours, I guess. So there you go. And now I want to point out something here while we have this map up. So California is diverse. You've been learning that on all your adventures, right? You got to go to the desert and the Borrego way in the southern part of California. You got to go to an urban park in LA, Baldwin Hills. I used to volunteer there. And then you went to Morro Bay. So you've seen all kinds of areas, but we are in an area called the Sierra Nevada Mountains. So I'm gonna circle these mountains. Now they take up about a quarter of our state and they are an amazing mountain range. The tallest peak in the whole lower 48 states is right here in our state, Mount Whitney. 
So the Sierra Nevada is a home of the giant sequoia. It's the only place they like to live naturally. And they only like to live on the west side of those mountains. So they're really picky trees about where they want to live. And while this map is up, I want to point out the cousin of the giant sequoia. Now, who has cousins? I'm sure a lot of you watching have cousins, right? I have a bunch of them. I love my cousins. So giant sequoia also has a cousin called the coast redwood. And they only grow on the coast of California. So they're two very similar trees. Uh, but they're also very different. They don't like to live in the same spot. So that's where the coast redwoods are. And they go into Oregon a little bit. And they are the tallest trees on earth. So aren't we lucky to live in a state that has the biggest trees on earth, this guy here, the giant sequoia, and the tallest trees on earth, the coast redwood. So there you go, everyone. That's where I am. And that's where you are. And back to our tree here. So let me take a quick look here and make sure. Uh, oh, good. Seven people are watching. Wonderful. That makes me feel like it's working. OK, so back to me here. Let me uh, click on this. Hold on, everybody. OK, so the giant sequoia, big tree, right? We just talked about that, bigger than the Statue of Liberty. So they're known for their size but they're also known for their red color. Look closely at this bark. You'll notice how red it is. So they are really red compared to all these other brown trees back here, huh? These are not all giant sequoias back here. There's only about three giant sequoias back here and it's hard to see them right now with this lighting. But the giant sequoia is a red tree. So we sometimes call them the Sierra Redwood because they grow in the Sierra Nevada mountains. And their bark is very different than other trees. Notice how red it is. And it's kind of soft and spongy. I can push right into it with my finger. It's a little fibrous, real soft tree. So their bark is different than other trees. And all trees have bark, right? And the bark is an important part of the tree. The bark is like the skin of the tree, right? The outer layer of the tree. And everything on a tree, every single thing, has a job to do. Trees are very efficient. Nothing is wasted on a tree. So what could be the job of the bark? It has an important job to do. What do we think, explorers? Maybe you want to type it into the chats, share with your class the role of the bark, the job of the bark. I'll give you a second. And I'll take a second, take a deep breath. I'm very excited to see you all. So the job of the bark, do you think it's to collect water? No. Do you think it's to make food? No. The job is to protect the tree, right? Yeah. Is that what some of you were thinking? Because think about our skin. Our skin's protecting our body, right? So the bark's protecting the tree. Because underneath this bark is other layers of wood that do their jobs. So the bark's got to protect those layers because everything in there is doing something. And the wood inside needs protection. It's real soft. So what does a tree need protection from? Let's think about that, explorers. What does a tree need protection from? There's all kinds of things in the forest that can harm a tree, right? Let's think about our living things here in a forest. This is a, a vibrant community of all kinds of living things, big and small. Are there any animals that can hurt a tree? What are y'all thinking? Is anybody thinking about this animal? I'm gonna pull it up here on my screen. This is probably one of the most damaging animals here. I'm not gonna lie, they can do a lot of 
uh, damage to our trees. Look at that guy right there. Was anybody thinking of a woodpecker? Yeah, that's a pileated woodpecker. They are a gorgeous bird. They're a big bird, about a foot tall. They have these striking red heads. And they do a lot of damage to the trees. They put these holes in them. Not to be mean, they're not trying to hurt the tree. They're just trying to eat. Their favorite food lives in the trees. Their favorite food is a carpenter ant, another living thing that can harm a tree. Other insects like bark beetle, termites, right? But what is really cool is that this tree in this picture is not a giant sequoia. That's a different tree. The pileated woodpeckers do not like to do this damage to a giant sequoia. Now, why is that? Well, the bark on a giant sequoia is very, very thick. It can grow to be as thick as a ruler. Everybody at home right now, hold up your imaginary rulers, about 12 inches, hold it up. Now add another imaginary ruler. Sometimes the bark on a giant sequoia can be as thick as two rulers. That is impressive for bark. Most bark on trees is like maybe a few inches max, right? So having a thick bark like this is really good because the woodpeckers and the insects don't wanna mess with this tree. Way too much work to get through all this bark into the good wood underneath. So this tree is protected from most living things here in the forest. Even tiny things like bacteria, fungus, diseases, well-protected tree right here. So those are some living things that can harm our trees, right? So let's talk about the non-living things. Let's think, explorers, what are some non-living things here in the forest that can harm our trees? Maybe you wanna use that chat again. Type in some of your ideas. Non-living things, well, let's think about the environment. We are in the mountains of California. I am 5,000 feet in elevation above you all near LA. I'm high. In the mountains, we get weather, don't we? Lots of it. If we were doing this adventure in November through maybe April, we would be in snow. So the giant sequoia is well protected from the weather. Bark is like having a really heavy coat per tree. And there's another thing here that the giant sequoia is well protected from. It's the opposite of cold. Maybe you're thinking the sun. Yeah, SPF right here. This is like SPF. Also, another hot thing. Another hot thing. Is anybody thinking about fire? Our giant sequoias are resistant to fire. Wow, not a lot of trees can claim that. Our giant sequoias are um, able to withstand fire. In fact, a lot of them are scarred from fire and they're still alive. Here's a picture of one of my favorite trees. We won't get to see this tree because it's far away. Our park's pretty big, 6,500 acres. But you are looking at my favorite tree. It's I think maybe 12 miles away or so. And it almost looks like two trees, doesn't it? But this is actually one tree with a giant hole burned into the trunk. You can stand inside of this giant sequoia and look up at the top of it, which is how I took this picture. And at the top, notice how green that tree is. It is living. It is alive and going strong, even though it's pretty much been burned in half. So these trees can withstand fire. They won't necessarily die from a fire. They might have a cool scar. Like when you get a scar on your skin and it leaves behind a mark. So there you go. These trees are one tough tree, aren't they? They can handle fire, cold weather, insects, animals, disease, fungus, all kinds of things because of their strong bark. These are true survivors right here. Giant sequoias can survive for a long time. 
And that is why they're so big, everyone. We just discovered the answer. We just solved a mystery of why the giant sequoias are big. They are big because they are strong. And because they are so strong, they can grow fast and really big every single year and live for thousands of years because of their thick bark. So as they get older, they get bigger, don't they? They grow around their trunk and they grow taller. So that is why the giant sequoia is so big, because it's an old tree. Trees typically get bigger as they get older, just like us, right? Sort of. Then we start to shrink when we get even older. Giant sequoia probably won't do that. So there we go. We just discovered how strong our giant sequoias are, why they're so big, and how old they can live. This one, by the way, I don't think I told you. This one is, I guess, maybe four to 500 years old. It's hard to know for sure because it's still alive. And we have some here that we estimate to be 3,000 years old. We're going to see one further down the trail that's uh, just over 1,000 years old. So they can live, probably outlive every single tree here because of their strong bark, mostly. And they are not the oldest tree on Earth. That title belongs to another tree in California, single-stemmed tree, I should say, uh, called the bristlecone pine. And that tree also lives in the Sierra Nevada. And you'll have to look that tree up on your own. We are not going to talk about that tree today, but that's another old tree. So here we go, everyone. We're going to keep going down the trail, get to our next stop. Uh, you might have noticed there's some people back here. We are on our most popular trail in the park. This is called the North Grove Trail. If you've been here, or if you do come here, you will probably walk this trail. It goes about a mile and a half. It goes around a lot of really big, wonderful giant sequoias. We're obviously not gonna do the whole mile today. We don't have time. And that building back here is our visitor center. Inside is a movie, gift shop, uh, exhibits, pictures, all kinds of fun things, stuffed animals. So we're open every day of the year. Cost ten dollars to get into our park by each car, and most people come here to hike the trail and see the giant sequoias. We also have an awesome river here, the Stanislaus. Uh, there's camping. There's um, yeah, all kinds of fun stuff here. So that's what we're normally known for. So we're going to see people today. Is what I was trying to say. Uh, we are on a popular trail. I am doing my best to stay away from the people, six feet at least. Uh, because I don't want to put on a mask right now and talk to you because it's kind of hard to talk through that. So that's what um, we're all looking at here and just want to point that out. So let's keep going. Right, I'm going to try not to shake you around. So we are in the habitat of the giant sequoia at Calaveras Big Tree State Park. Their habitat is obviously a forest. This is not a rainforest, though. This type of forest is called a mixed conifer forest because we are surrounded by a mixture of conifers. So what is a conifer tree? Well, a conifer tree is a cone-bearing tree. Every single conifer has its own cone. We have about eight different conifers here. The giant sequoia is one of them right here in the front with these really big trunks. These are some incense cedars. Oh, there's some squirrels back there running up and down a, another giant sequoia. I don't know if you all can see them. Those are chicory squirrels. We also have fir trees here, pine trees. So it's a diverse forest because we also have trees with leaves like this here um, oak tree. So mixed conifer forest. So conifers are known to have a cone. They also typically have a green needle instead of a flat green leaf. And they're the big trees, all the big trunks you see back there are the conifers. They're known for their size too, pretty big trees. So I am gonna set you all down right here next to this poor dead fir tree. And we're gonna talk about these cones 
because I'm sure you're all wondering how a giant sequoia grows. And we're going to find out at the stop right here. So I found something on the ground I'm excited to show you. It is probably one of the biggest cones I've seen. Check this out. Wow. That's a big one, isn't it? It barely fits on the camera. It's even bigger than my head. So we have some big cones at Calaveras Big Trees. And the cone has an important job to do. Remember, I told you, everything on a tree has a job. So what could be the job of the cone? Hmm. What do we think, explorers? Well, what could be in here? Maybe the seeds? Yeah, the cone's job is to protect the seeds. So sometimes the seeds are big, so the cones are big. And there used to be a lot of seeds in here, but they've all fallen out. So this is an example of a big cone. And you can think of cones as a seed holder or a seed pod. So there you go, there's one kind of cone. But I wanna show you a couple more here, just to compare. But you all are in a very sunny spot. Let me try to fix this here. Hang tight, everybody. There we go, that's a little better. Okay, back to the cones. So I wanna show you this other cone here on the ground. Totally different cone. Wow, these chicories are <laughs> having fun. Look at this cone, really prickly, real sharp little spines on it. Totally different, different tree. So the seeds to this tree were in here. Now I wanna show you one of the smallest cones here, probably the second smallest cone. Check out this one. This one looks to be about the size of a chicken egg. It can fit right there in my hand. Real small cone. So one of these cones I just showed you came from a giant sequoia. And I'm curious to know which one you all think. So why don't we take a second to type it into all your little chats, all your little chat boxes out there, which one? Could it be the small one? I think this giant sequoia might surprise us by having a little cone. Or do you think they have a medium cone? Or, you squirrels are distracting me, sorry everyone. Do you think this giant cone is a giant sequoia? What do we all think? Type it in. Or think in your, in your brains. Everyone make their scientific guess. Are we ready to find out which one it is? Can you give me a little drum roll at home? Maybe some drums for the big reveal. The giant sequoia cone is the little one. Who was thinking that? I know, they're full of surprises, aren't they? Giant sequoia have a small cone. This is average size for their cone, by the way. This big one, which I'm guessing a lot of you thought was the giant sequoia cone, most students do, you're not alone. This came from a sugar pine. Sugar pines have the biggest cone here, although they are not the biggest tree. And these cones hang on the branches, by the way, like a Christmas ornament, and they fall down when it's windy. So it is a scary place to be when it's windy here. This cone hit me in the head once, Ponderosa pine cone, and it hurts a lot. So they come down from the trees and then the wind sort of blows their seeds around. And that's how they disperse their seeds because the seed needs to travel. It can't just stay in one spot sometimes because that spot not, might not be good. And we'll talk about that in a second. So let's look closely inside this giant sequoia cone. You might see the seeds in there. I don't know, the, I'm not having good luck here with this lighting. Let's see. I can get it a little bit better here. Yeah, no, the sun is just, let me move over here now that I showed you my cone. So inside here 
are maybe 100 to 200 seeds. And if you look close, you might be able to see them in there. They're really light brown. They're in the cracks of the cone. They're in there. And they will come out eventually, but they're not ready yet. This cone has to fully dry for the seeds to finally release themselves and open the cone and let them come out. So it takes a while to do that. It's going to take probably all summer for this cone to finally dry out. And how do they dry out? From heat. Heat from our sunshine or heat from a fire. And inside here, I want to show you what the seeds look like. I have some in my pocket here. Put them here in my hand and bring them on up to you so you can see what a giant sequoia looks like when it's a seed. Look at that, how tiny, really tiny. What do they remind you of? Do they look like a food? Do they remind you of a different seed? Hmm. A lot of students say sunflower seeds sometimes. But they remind me of oatmeal, breakfast, granola bars. They're about the same size as a flake of oat. And this tiny little seed is going to become the world's biggest tree. Isn't that amazing that the giant sequoias start off their life as such a tiny thing? But not every seed's going to make it. Remember that map I showed you? Remember the yellow? Do we see a lot of yellow? No. These trees have trouble growing. Even though one tree can produce millions of seeds and cones, Scientists think only one of those million will turn into one of our big trees. It's a tough life for a seed out here. Because what are the needs of a seed? Seeds have needs, right? Seeds have three basic needs. What are they? Anyone want to type in all three needs of a seed? Give you all a second to think about it. The three needs of a seed. Seeds actually could maybe even need five things. If you can get all five, I would say extra credit. So three needs, let's talk about the need for sun, right? Seeds gonna need some sunshine to grow. It's crowded here. All these trees are blocking the sun. So it's hard to find a good sunny spot for a little seed. Some seeds can grow in the shade, not our giant sequoia. They need a lot of sun. They also need a lot of water. And where does the water come from? Here in the Sierra Nevada mountains of California. Do you think we have a sprinkler system? Do you think we have hoses for the trees? No, we have 6,500 acres to maintain here. That would be a lot of work. The giant sequoia need water in the form of snow. Is that what everyone was thinking? And sometimes rain too, but we get mostly snow here. Remember in the beginning I told you we would be doing a snowy field trip if this were November through April. And it is a snowy wonderland here. And we get a lot of snow. And if we don't get a lot of snow, the giant sequoia is not a happy tree. And when they're not happy, they can get sick. So they need a lot of water, sunshine. Third thing, was anyone thinking about soil? The seeds need to grow in something, right? They can't just grow anywhere. They need a good soil with plenty of room around to grow. So sunshine, water, soil, room. And was anyone thinking about air? Seed's gonna need some oxygen, some air. So five needs of a seed, sunshine, water, air, soil, space. And it's hard to get all those things. If you're a little seed, you saw how little that giant sequoia seed was. So it's 
it's hard for them to grow sometimes. And the giant sequoia actually need a sixth thing. Now, explorers, I want to see if you can guess what that sixth thing is. I'm going to give you some hints. Listen carefully to my hints. This thing can destroy life and create life. This sixth thing can burn, oh, I just gave it away, can ruin entire towns and entire forests. Yeah, I just gave it away, sorry. I was trying to like make it more suspenseful. The sixth thing is fire. Now, why on earth would a tree need fire to grow? Doesn't that sound odd? Because we think of fire here in California as a bad thing, don't we? Think about all of our wildfires we get uh, summer and the fall in California. Yeah, we think of fire as, as a destructive force, but it can be creative too. In fact, in the, in the world of a giant sequoia, it is. And I'm not talking about a wildfire. We do certain kinds of fires here that help to clean the forest. These types of fires are called controlled burns or prescribed burns or broadcast burns. They have several names because we were talking about soil, right? How the giant sequoia need uh, healthy soil to grow. Well, you would think I'm in a forest here full of healthy soil, but beneath my feet is this, a bunch of litter. Trees are kind of dirty. They make a lot of litter. You're looking at some bark here dried up needles, twigs and sticks, all kinds of tree litter. And this litter is all over the forest floor. Do you think a seed is gonna wanna grow in this? No, it's gonna get lost. So sometimes we have to clean this away. And we can't use a vacuum or a leaf blower. We do use fire though. And we do these types of fires several times a year. We're doing one right now. And these fires are started by professionals. They're not just like willy nilly fires. They take a lot of planning. We have to check the weather, all kinds of things before we burn the forest. It takes a lot of effort to do these fires. And this is what they look like. I'm gonna pull up a, a picture of one of our prescribed burns here, just to show you uh, how small they are and close to the ground. There you go, you should be seeing a uh, prescribed burn right there. What you're not seeing is probably 20 people that are involved in these fires, 20 to 30 people. It takes a lot of effort, a lot of firefighters come to help us, scientists. Uh, we have a burn boss named Ben, real nice guy. So he uh, leads these teams to burn the forest. So prescribed burns are small fires. We don't want them to get up into the treetops because that will kill the tree. So these fires have to be done very carefully, close to the ground because that's where all the litter is. We wanna get this litter out of the way. All the dead trees too, burn them away. Help to recycle all this litter. And this is another picture of a prescribed burn. You can see there's a little firefighter down there with a torch. That's how they light the fire. And they light the ground. It makes a lot of smoke. So sometimes our neighbors don't like us. They get mad, they post to Facebook, all kinds of mean things. But sometimes uh, we have to just have a fire anyway. You can't have fire without smoke. And this fire is gonna be good in the long run. It's gonna regenerate our forest, clean it up, make room for our giant sequoia seeds to grow. And then after that fire's done burning, it will leave behind a nutrient rich ash that helps to uh, get the seeds going. It's like fertilizer. That fire also helps to open up these cones. Remember, I told you, they need heat to open. So this one's starting its process to open, but heat also helps do that. So there you go, everyone. Giant sequoias are one needy tree. They need sunshine, water, air, soil, space, and fire to grow. That's probably why we didn't see a lot of yellow on that map. They have trouble growing. All right, friends, well, we have one next stop for our adventure today. I'm gonna to check in with YouTube here. Oh, ooh, 
yay, we have three more people watching. Well, welcome. If you're joining us late, we are at Calaveras Big Tree State Park here in the Sierra Nevada Mountains of California. My name is Jenny, and I'm very excited to be teaching you all about our giant sequoias today, California's native iconic trees. So we're going to get to our next stop here. But before we do that, I'm going to give you all a little giant sequoia challenge. Are you all ready? Do we feel like we got our brains working? We got enough giant sequoia knowledge to take on a challenge? Well, I feel confident you guys are ready. So here you go. Here's your challenge question. And you get to talk about it with your class in the chats and think about it because I'm going to give you one minute to come up with the right answer. And then when we get to our next stop, we'll discuss it as a group, okay? So remember, beginning of our field trip adventure, we learned about how strong our giant sequoias are. Their bark protects them from insects, animals, disease, fungus, bacteria, fire, the weather, all kinds of things. They are a strong tree, they are a survivor, and they can live for thousands of years. But everything that's living has a life cycle, right? They are not gonna live forever. So what is the biggest threat to their existence? What is going to really kill a giant sequoia? What's gonna uh, harm them the most of all the things that can harm a tree? So you get to think about this challenge question, the biggest threat to the life of a giant sequoia. And I'm gonna give you 60 seconds, maybe, depending, depending on how long it takes me to walk, uh, to come up with some answers. Now use that chat and see how good you're gonna do when we get to our next stop, okay? Think about all the things we discussed. Think about this climate, this environment, the mountains. Think about, well, I'm not gonna tell you to think. I'm gonna let you think. Cause I'm guessing you all are gonna get this answer. Biggest threat to the life of a giant sequoia. How we doing out there? You all ready to talk about it? Everyone got their ideas? All right. So biggest threat to the life of a giant sequoia. Was anyone thinking about fire? I know a lot of students guess fire. And if a real bad fire were to come through here, would certainly burn the giant sequoias. Even though we talked about how resistant they are to fire, if it was a real bad one, I'm guessing they're probably not gonna survive. So fire can be a, a threat maybe. Was anyone thinking about lack of water? Remember we discussed snow, how much snow they need. We need really snowy winters for our giant sequoias to be happy trees. Uh, what else? What else do some students think? Anyone think in climate change? That's a hot topic, isn't it? Climate change. Was anyone thinking people? I think of all the threats to a giant sequoia, people is the biggest. Now, how could such a little person hurt such a big tree? Well, this was not always a park. Today, we are protecting these trees. We are taking care of this forest so uh, they can live a long, healthy life. We're also protecting this forest for you and our visitors and this community of animals. But this wasn't always a park. No, this became a park in 1931. So our giant sequoias were threatened by us in the form of cutting them down. I'm gonna turn this camera. 
to show you our famous discovery tree, which is now a discovery stump. This could have easily been one of our biggest trees in the park, but it was cut down a long time ago in the 1850s. It is now a five foot tall stump. It used to tower 280 feet. And this happened in the 1850s. So what else was happening in the 1850s, everyone? We are in California. There was something going on during that time. I'll give you a hint a very shiny, valuable rock was discovered out here. The gold rush, right? And we are surrounded by gold mining communities here. Towns like Columbia, Murphy, Angels Camp, Arnold, these are all gold mining communities. And that brought in a lot of new people once gold got discovered. These people violently displaced our Miwok and Washoe who lived in peace and harmony here for hundreds of years prior to the gold rush. And the gold rush brought in all these new people into this forest. Remember, this wasn't a park yet. This forest was very wild, full of bears, full of all kinds of trees. Um, no roads were created yet. They brought in a lot of people to this forest. One of these people was named Augustus. Augustus Dowd is the person uh, responsible for discovering our discovery tree. And he saw this tree on a bear hunt, was blown away, because it was alive back then, by the way, I should mention, this was not always a stump. It was this big, beautiful tree. He told all his mining friends about it. All his mining friends would not believe him. They thought he was making up another one of his stories. They all came here, decided they wanted to cut down the giant sequoia. Why would they do that? This was a different time in California's history. People were all about making their money. So they cut this tree down to make money in the form of a museum exhibit. Pieces of the bark were taken. Pieces of this tree were taken, put back together like a puzzle in two museum ex exhibits, one in New York and one in England. And both these exhibits burned down. So that's why they did it. And this took a huge effort to cut down a tree in the 1850s, as you can imagine. So while we have a break in visitors coming, we're gonna walk up there. Are you all ready to go stand on top of a giant sequoia stump with me? Here we go. We're gonna quickly go up here because there's people coming down the trail. And remember, I wanna physically distance. So here we go up the stairs here. Now, as we walk up here, Think about some things. Think about how old this tree might be. What's your guess? Think about how they did this. What kind of tools do we have available back in the 1850s? So we made it. I'm gonna go walk across here to the other side so you can see how wide this tree is 25 feet wide, 90 feet around. I bet it's bigger than most of your bedrooms at home. If you're bored later, you can measure one wall in your bedroom, multiply it by four, see how big your bedroom is compared to this giant sequoia stump. So how old is it? Anyone put any guesses in the chats? Well, at one point you can see the rings. They counted about 1,200 rings, 1,244. And it could have lived for another 1,200 years. Did I say 1,000? I meant 100, 1,200. And that's how old this tree was. It's a healthy, big, beautiful tree. Now behind me here, you're seeing this, this shape. Most of you are probably thinking it's a rock, but it's actually the rest of the tree, trunk of our giant sequoia here. And the lighting is just not, oh, there we go. The lighting's cooperating for once. There you go. This is the trunk of the tree right here. And this is a sugar pine, by the way. Remember that cone I showed you? 
this is the tree that started growing after the giant sequoia was cut down in 1853. So how do they do this? Anyone putting in their chats? How do you think they cut down a tree that weighs millions of pounds? Well, you'll see a little clue right here. All these horizontal lines are the marks from the mining tools they use to do this. They use really big drills called augers, about this big around, about 10 feet long, and they twisted them over and over into the tree with a wooden handle. That's what all these marks are. Use a little bit of an ax down here, and then the tree finally fell. So that's how they did it. We learned why they did it. it took about 13 men to do this in almost a month because uh, it was a slow process taking down this giant. So that's how they did it, why they did it, and why we don't do things like this anymore. Well, a lot of people were upset by seeing the giant sequoia in this shape because we've been learning how special these trees are. They're very rare, they're very unique, they're very big, they're very hard to grow. And many people wanted to see them protected and preserved. So eventually, California was able to buy this forest with the intention to protect the trees. This happened in 1931 though. So prior to that, the giant sequoia were threatened by people, deforestation, destruction, cutting down the trees. Today, the threats are more environmental, right? Maybe some of you were guessing uh, on your challenge question, um, maybe some of you guessed climate change. So yeah, that can certainly harm a giant sequoia because who's, what's climate change caused by? Well, it's also caused by us, right? So people can still threaten these trees. Modern days, climate change, historically more so deforestation and development, cutting down the trees. Climate change though, is caused by us because of our pollution, right? Carbon's getting trapped in our atmosphere. Carbon from our, uh, carbon from dioxide from our cars, our transportation, our factories. It's getting stuck up there. Like a blanket, it's warming our earth. And it's causing things like drought, like wildfires, like our oceans rising. So yeah, these trees are still threatened by people, even today. All right, friends, well, I'm gonna just point out one last thing and then we made it to the very end of our adventure today. You might be wondering about the natural end of the giant sequoia's life cycle because if we don't get involved, these trees can live for 3,000 years. However, there is something naturally that can harm these trees. Their roots are actually very, very shallow. For such a big tree, their roots are maybe about as deep as I am tall, five foot seven, maybe eight feet max. And the roots provide two functions for the tree. Remember, everything on a tree is a job. Roots have two jobs. What are they? What are the two jobs of the roots? Well, is everyone thinking about the water? Soaking up that water, they're like straws for the tree, soaking up that water. The other function is to hold the tree up. And the roots on a giant sequoia are actually not so good at holding up the tree because they're very shallow, which is awesome for absorbing water quickly, but it's not so good for holding the tree up. So a lot of our giant sequoias are on the ground here. If you walk our trail, if you keep going, you're gonna walk through a giant sequoia trunk, like a subway tunnel. And there's a famous giant sequoia here that fell um, four years ago or so. You might even recognize this tree once I pull up this picture. And this will be the last little segment here of our adventure. So one last little thing here. Thanks everyone for your attention. So this tree is a, one of those tunnel trees. A many, many redwoods and giant sequoias had tunnels carved in them like this by people. So you can drive through them, walk through them, take your horse through them. This is an old picture. Uh, says 1908 down there in the corner. Eventually, California owned this place. 1931, we made it into a 
a protected area, a park. So we stopped allowing cars to go through. You can walk through though, our trail went through it. Up until about four years ago, we had a really, really snowy winter. It was so snowy that once all the snow melted, it created this lake, this little puddle around this tree. That puddle softened the roots, softened the trunk, and this giant sequoia fell over. And this happened in the early, early morning on a very stormy day. Luckily, because it could have fallen on someone. This was a very popular part of our trail. And this is what it looks like today. The roots you see on the left are in the air. Very shallow roots, shattered into small pieces, took down a whole bunch of trees around it. And now you can walk around the tree, can't go through it anymore. So luckily this happened on a very stormy, cold day when no one was here. So there you go, that's the natural end of their life cycle. This happens um, all the time uh, to these trees. This happened four years ago uh, to this 2000 year old giant sequoia. And then we have many trees here on the trail that are on the ground too. So they can die on their own. Even though we've been learning how strong they are. Remember in the beginning, we talked about how their bark, super thick. Even though they're so strong, they still are vulnerable to human impact, to environmental impacts. So we learned so much today on our adventure. We talked all about how strong they are, how they can live a long life because of their bark. We learned how they grow from a seed inside of a cone. We learned about the needs of their seeds, including fire. We just took a challenge together. You all did awesome, I'm guessing. We talked about the threats to their life, historically, deforestation, cutting them down, more modern threats, climate change. And then we talked about the end of their life cycle. And even though their cycle ends, their legacy continues because the dead tree is still performing a job. It's breaking down, creating nutrients and soil. It's providing a home for our animals, over 70 types of animals here. And it's also um, providing habitat um, for the critters, all the little bugs and things, for the decomposers. So giant sequoias are amazing trees in their death and in their life. And I am so grateful for your attention today and for letting me share them with you at Calaveras Big Tree State Park, Los Angeles Unified School District. I hope you all have a safe and healthy summer. I hope you get to see a giant sequoia in real life because they are incredible trees. And I don't do them justice. Uh, you have to see them in real life. Uh, luckily, I'm only maybe five, six hours away from you all. I hope you get to see them one day. If not here, maybe another park. And just a reminder, now you've all traveled to California on your last adventure. Thank you all for taking all four adventures. And we are really lucky to live in California. I do field trips with students all over the world. They don't have what we have. They don't have our beautiful oceans like Morro Bay. They don't have our awesome deserts like Anza Borrego. Students don't even have our city parks like Baldwin Hills. A lot of students don't even have our trees. We have the biggest trees on earth in California and the tallest. So we're really lucky to live in this state. And I hope after all these field trips, you're inspired to check out more of your parks. There's plenty near LA to check out if you can't get all the way up here. Make sure if you do go to the parks, make sure you're checking websites and stuff because things are changing all the time with our coronavirus. So thank you everyone, have a healthy and safe summer and get outside today and hug a tree, enjoy the trees in your neighborhood. All right, bye LAUSD. Thanks for joining me. Bye everyone. <laughs>